the CSIS. My name is Jim Lewis. Um, today's event is on supply chain security and software. As we move to a software-driven world where software is at the core of all products, um, all services, and increasingly much of what the military does, um, securing the supply chain for software has become more important. So this event looks at some of the initiatives out there, both government and private sector, to think about how we make software uh, more reliable, how we make the software supply chain more secure. The order today is we're going to have William Stevens give a keynote address. He'll be followed by a panel of experts. Um, we'll then have time for Q&A. Uh, Bill can take a few Q&A uh, at the end of his remarks. Let me introduce him. I won't introduce the panel. Bios, which are and exciting, are online. Uh, we will provide them throughout the CSIS website. But William Stevens is a member of the Defense Intelligence or exec Defense Intelligence Senior Executive Service, and he's the director of the counterintelligence counterintelligence at DSS. Um, he's been that since 2009, so that's a good long career for counterintelligence support to over 13,000 defense contractors in facilities employing many, many more people than that. Uh, Bill comes to DSS from a distinguished military career where he worked at the office, Air Force Office of Special Investigations, most of us know them, uh, where he was promoted up over time to very, a number of senior positions, including on the Air Staff and the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Going to give us an overview of some of the work uh, DSS is doing in supply chain security and maybe talk a little bit about how DSS may be evolving. So, with that, Bill, thank you. Thank you. So, where's the one that hits the. Yes, the blazer is It's right here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. Oop. Uh oh. I'm here with software people and see if I can control this machine here, so let's go to the first one. This one right there has a phone. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Stevens again, Director of Security at the Defense Security Service, Director of Counterintelligence at the Defense Security Service, and uh, I'll be briefly talking really about um, these issues here. Deliver uncompromised is the notion, as a concept, where it came from, and how it is looking at that. The challenge I think that we're facing today, right? The challenge that we're facing at uh, DSS, uh, as far as making a, a um, uh, strategic picture out of actually tactical issues, methods of operations and contact, how it is that we, we think, in fact, uh, our opponents are actually touching us, and we like to think that we have control at least of a significant piece of it. And then the last piece that may be of interest here, I don't know, um, as far as blended operations, cyber and non-cyber marriage is the way we actually describe it here. So DSS, for those of you who don't know, uh, our responsibility is to have uh, oversight, security oversight for cleared industry uh, firms that are working on uh, uh, classified contracts. Um, with that, at least right now, we have 900 people. I'm the counterintelligence guy. We have 150 people actually to actually deal with, ultimately deal with the challenge. Okay, so I'm providing, you know, this picture here. Has anybody seen this picture? Anybody at uh, Consumer Electronics Show? Yeah, and so this was uh, this was publicized. I think this is pretty interesting. So deliver uncompromised is a notion. Um, really, it's you know what what is the value? What is the proposition? Protecting information and actually keeping secrets. To me, this is a private example or a private firm example. This sign was at the 2019 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. Um, Apple apparently had no presence, but they actually put this up. Why is it that they would do that? It seems to me that they probably view that uh, as a business discriminator. They didn't show up to the show itself, but they put this apparently in a whole bunch of places all over town. So it makes you, at least from my perspective, that's them delivering their uh, 
pro their products uncompromised. Um, if you think back, is it 2015 or 2016, I think, in San Bernardino, there was a terrorist attack. And in that terrorist attack, um, uh, an iPhone was used. And uh, when the FBI went and tried to, get, tried to break that phone, apparently, this is what we all were told, I think, is that they were unable to actually get that, get through that, get break that. Eventually, maybe they got into it. I can't remember the whole story. But what I do know is it took a long time, and it was publicized a lot. So was Apple's brand, did it go up? because they were able to do that? Was it, did the value increase because of that? I would propose so. It, it certainly spoke a lot to their ability to actually secure a capability. More recently, as far as, uh, as, far as being secure goes, this is private firm stuff, Facebook, they're getting into the privacy game. Who would have imagined a year ago that uh, Mr. Zuckerberg would be focusing on that and calling for active United States government involvement in increased security? That's kind of amazing. Looking at the, the general data protection regulations that are in Europe is the ideal. So what is that? From my perspective, that essentially is deliver uncompromised. And how is it that we can instill this concept in DOD's efforts to actually dis to, uh, extend our technological advantage and where we do have a technological advantage for as long as possible to be able to convey information under, under one's own initiative and not the unapproved initiative of others. In other words, keeping a secret. It's kind of important. So here's the notion of delivered and compromised. The definition, I'll give you this, you read this definition, when did it come about and how did it come about? <clears throat> In 2010, um, I was at a meeting, the National Counterintelligence Policy Board, at the Nas and that's where all the three-letter agencies uh, have their uh, counterintelligence people meeting. And uh, we were in a discussion about, and one of my friends was the counterintelligence guy at one of the other three-letter agencies, and he was lamenting that they had received a product that had been compromised, and they, when, when it arrived, it was compromised. And we were just simply talking about, I was newly from the Air Force, I spent 27 years in the Air Force doing this sort of thing and loving it, and um, I, it never occurred to me that that would not be like a major goal when we actually tried to purchase our stuff or get our things. And I thought, in fact, that, um, I w again, I was very surprised. So during that conversation, we were talking, we basically talked about why is it that there's not a requirement that the, these products be delivered and compromised? Is that not the goal? You know, it seemed to me that the taxpayers would think so. So over time, the notion of deliver and compromise, we nurtured it at DSS. We had conversations with people like Lynn Matisse about this issue. We briefed many Department of Defense officials, many in acquisition, briefed it on the Hill. We had facilitated discussions with this. More recently, and, and we developed it, I think, pretty well, but last year it was, provide, it was given to MITRE as a concept, and it matched up with a lot of the activity that they were engaged in, and it led to a paper that Bob Metzger is, I think, going to speak about here um, when it's his turn. So um, that is, so why is it that, what's the reason for us to actually have to do this? Well, we are in an all-of-nation competition with more than one, uh, more than one country, not nation-state competition, but all of the nation competition where a couple of countries at least have all the elements of national power, military, economic, political information, academic, however you want to describe it, exceedingly well focused on coming after American technology. That's what I get to deal with every day and that's what we clearly see. We clearly see it. This definition may seem daunting, it's something that's uh, almost impossible to do, I don't know, but what it is, is sort of like winning a ball game. You don't set out playing a ball game thinking that you're going to lose. Surely you're going to set out hoping, in fact, that you're going to win, and that's going to be the goal to actually win. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. So, quickly, the definition, to deliver uncompromised warfighting capabilities to operating forces, that's the people that are actually out there ready to go, without critical information and or technology being wittingly or unwittingly, lost, stolen, denied, degraded, or inappropriately given away or sold, or at least to be able to answer for or account for how something took place. So back to the reason for this. The threat that we face and the challenge we face, my boss, uh, Dan Payne, who's the director of Defense Security Service, will often repeat, the threat that we face is the greatest threat, at least that he's ever seen, and that's true for me as well. We are in a very highly contested environment with our opponents quite successfully taking our stuff. This stu this, th that statement that's supported by intelligence community reporting, intelligence community analysis, 
uh, as well as open source. Uh, I suspect there's no one here that doesn't recognize it. We surely we see it every couple of days in the news, I think, don't we, uh, where it is that we've had some significant challenges. So are we winning? Bear Bryant, uh, in this challenge, in this competition for a technological advantage, Bear Bryant, who used to be uh, the National Counterintelligence Executive, the senior policy official for counterintelligence in the United States government, he would always ask us, the, the, the people at the three letter, in the three-letter agencies, when we would go before him to be scrubbed to see with whether we're getting our jobs done, his had one question, he would start the conversation, it was always, are we winning? And, um, you know, it's not a very American thing to do to say that we're not. I think they're certainly not to say that we're losing, but the challenge is clear. Our losses are quite profound. All you have to do is, you know, watch TV, uh, exfil at OPM and situations like that, I think, make very clear that our opponents are actually coming at us uh, in a broad range of uh, directions uh, uh, to achieve what it is that they're trying to achieve. Why is this important? Well, uh, innovation, of course, is critical. Every, no one would deny that. But it's actually really critical to the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and the national military strategy. So the way that works, national, national security strategy is overarching. National defense strategy is what military people would call grand strategy, or our ability to resource the fight. And then the bottom thing is actually what you actually do, the national military strategy, how it is that you accomplish it. So with all that information and all of our, you know, all of those really turn on the Americans being technologically very well advanced and, and being ahead. So with that, now, is there a strategy to actually secure the innovation upon which those other three strategies ultimately turn? And uh, if there is, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure that I know of what it might be. There's certainly a lot of practices that we engage in. That's the reason for Deliver Uncompromised. Is there a way to capture this uh, as early as possible, not just in the acquisition process, but as early as possible, that the government officials first know what is the objectives, and then they pass that down because industry is where we actually create all this, uh, this stuff. It's not generally, it's not created in government. So uh, Delivered Uncompromised at least is an answer for this. So if you think about it, do we properly value the securing of that information and that technology. Uh, and I would propose, it looks like Apple and Facebook seem to be placing a higher priority on securing, uh, securing things, but how is it that we do it, or how should we do it, or is there a way to do it? I'm not certain. I'm, I'm a knuckle dragon counterintelligence guy. I've done this for a long, long time, and I've loved it, but in monetizing something like this, however, I think is something that maybe it is that we'll have to, uh, to move towards. So, to get the risk and the reward actually appropriately balanced. If you think about it, in the process when, when we're making something, um, quite often security is just an expense to be maximally reduced. Maximally reduced, right? So the people that are actually trying to purchase a capability, they're trying to spend their money appropriately, but they in fact benefit from less money being spent on securing a capability. Who suffers? Well, in the case of weapons, it's, you know, your kids or your grandkids at a future date on a future battlefield that are the ones that are going to suffer because somebody was able to uh, get, you know, because of the, the decisions made on whether or not to secure, uh, secure capabilities up front. So we have to bring that better into balance, at least from my perspective. So what is the differential? What are we talking about? What is the value of an uncompromised capability? What's the differential between a compromised and an uncompromised capability? Could that be the money that's spent on a counterintelligence and security program, a very good one possibly? Would we be willing to pay that? Um, would, what's more valuable, 100 compromised jets or 80 uncompromised jets? I have my guess. I don't know the answer to that, but I would propose that's one way that you could possibly value that. How much would we pay to not lose a capability, we being the Americans? How much would we pay to get an advantage back that we had lost? That's also, I think, uh, a, pretty, a pretty critical thing So, as far as how we have to think about the problem. So from my perspective, part and parcel of what we're trying to get at is exactly this. How do we monetize it? How do we think about these losses? Because security and counterintelligence or securing a capability is a big deal, and I would propose it's an increasingly big deal, whether you're talking about you know, proprietary information or you're talking about a, a secret for the, for, for the government. 
So um, my next point here is I say we're not helpless. So it's pretty, um, we do, at least in my opinion, uh, you know, the Americans actually have people that can do this kind of stuff and do it, I think, quite well. It's, it's different here in the United States than it would be in a conflict type environment as far as managing these things. And we have to uh, focus. Um, but we do have, and I'll show you here in a second, that we, map, we have a way of mapping out the challenge so that I think at least we at least have an understanding of what's taking place. And then theoretically, you could follow through and probably deal with that challenge or who is, who is creating the problems for us. Um, so the daunting definition there of deliver on compromise is a goal. Um, our opponents, um, in my opinion, they uh, have the initiative, and so in military terms, that means basically we're responding to them, they're not responding to us. And that's not a situation, at least, that I think that most of us like to be in, but that's the situation we're in. So establishing deliver and compromise is a goal, and what would it, what would it look like? Well, Mida wrote a paper and it had, that has 15 different points in that paper of what, you know, what, what it might mean. I'll just give you a few examples of what it might mean. So the idea would be, in fact, we would have it specifically as a goal. We would require and tell the program managers of a program or at the beginning of any sort of activity, the objective here is to deliver this thing uncompromised. Now, we don't expect people to be magic, right? So essentially, that, that would mean that we would pass that eventually down to the prime, and the prime would operate at a certain state of care. Mr. Metzger may be speaking about that in a little bit, but that's an established definition, established that legally uh, as a definition of what is it that the expectations are. Operate at a certain state of care. The next idea is if they're operating at that state of care, they would actually affirm, would actually achieve safe harbor. So they're not expected to be magic, but they are expected to operate at a significant with a significant capability. So in the event there's a loss, or, and they're determined to, in fact, have been responsible for the loss, if they were operating at the appropriate state of care, then, in fact, um, they would achieve safe harbor, and they would not be exposed to litigation. If, however, they were negligent or grossly negligent, then, in fact, they would be exposed to litigation, and the Americans would get back some of the money that they had hopefully invested in that capability. The next thing, is if they're exposed to litigation, we think there would be an insurance uh, um, market that might grow associated with that, and if that, in fact, was the case, then the, um, uh, the company would have a, uh, um, they would have lower premiums if they performed well and higher premiums uh, if, in fact, they did not. And then the last piece related to this that I will mention is the, um, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, conversation about small firms not being able to play because the, because the expense of security. Part of the idea, and you'll see it in the paper written by MITRE, is that there would be tax incentives. So if a, if a firm, small firm is working on, or any firm is working on um, uh, specific stuff the United States government, then their security efforts would win them a tax break, and or there were, MITRE did some roundtables on this issue, and I think that um, they found it more attractive to have low interest loans or no interest loans or something that. They thought that was as attractive as a, a tax incentive, but the point is, how is it that we can actually incentivize the appropriate conduct and behavior uh, for, um, uh, for these firms? So I mentioned that we map this problem. All right. So this is essentially what we do. We don't protect for nothing. We protect for a reason. You're protecting against the activity of someone. So I propose that if you're trying to reduce the complexity, that you have to focus on what the opponent is, who the opponent is. Here I have four of them in those black dots at the top. If you look at the bottom here, which uh, the middle is the methods that our opponents use against us. And the bottom essentially is, uh, essentially is the, um, the ways they touch us. So they touch us with email, they touch us physically and with contacts, they touch us at conferences, they touch us with resume submissions, et cetera. Here, that's an example, let's see if this builds correctly. There's another one and there's another one. Those are three examples for real activity. The first one is the exploitation of experts at trade shows. The second one is, uh, um, um, I think but the, the next two are basically requests for information by email. Simple. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, that kind of report actually will make, makes the difference between having a tactical activity and something that can be strategically managed. Because the way we observe these things is pretty simple. 
or orient on the opponent, orient on the opponent, which company are they approaching, which country is it that's making the approach, which technology are they in fact attempting to steal, and then what methods are they using. Sounds pretty simple. It is pretty simple, but this is not, and this is not typically what's been done in a security act, uh, activity, but that's what we do. We can capture this picture. Now, multiply that bottom line there times 10,000, and then that's the number of firms. And then you think of the number of reports, in fact, that we receive. So in a, we get 50,000 reports in a year, and we triage those down to 8,000 that we would consider of a counterintelligence interest. And then we break the information up, and we, and we uh, put it in a... Um, a way at least we think is usable, and this is what we in fact have. So I will, um, uh, this again, you're talking about the map here. This is actually a real American firm. The way we have this, we have, there's 25 different technologies, uh, categories that we break, uh, break up um, the activity into. Our, the United States uh, Department of Defense, how it is that we categorize those technologies. This firm probably has 20 of those, so it's a big firm. And then what we do is we look at all the activity across the United States for those 20 technologies, and we compare this firm to all the activity across the United States. So, for example, let's see if I can make this work. You see that 43 there in the one, right? So across the United States, for these 20 technologies, there, would be 40, there were 43 reports. This firm had one report, so the question is, is that adequate, is that appropriate, as a, as a vector for understanding what your challenge is? You can look over here. There are 457 reports across the United States as it concerns this particular approach, and you'll notice that this firm had actually no reports. So it would be very unusual, in fact, that they wouldn't have it. Now, this, this is actually something that we just started this past year on how to focus our, focus our opponents. So again, this is how we can, in fact, map uh, what our opponents are doing. So hopefully we can defend better and then respond a little bit better. Th again, this is a real example for a real firm, and we can do, we can do this. Uh, if we have the capacity, we can do this for any firm that we deal with. Uh, it is a challenge because of the number of people we have on working against uh, working the problem. So again, I'm trying to just to depict here what our challenge is and the, whether or not we actually have control of it. This is the last thing I'm going to show because these are you all are this is a, this is a software kind of activity, and I think that one of the greatest mistakes that we make make collectively is distinguishing between cyber activity and non cyber as far as threats concerned. Why do I say that? For the last two years, this most recent year, um, of those reports that I mentioned to you, this most recent year, 16% of them were cyber only, 30% were human only, and 54% had indicators of both. Previous year, it wasn't that much different. It was 30% cyber, 30% uh, human only, 14% um, cyber only, and 50% 6 both. So if you have somebody that's heavily focused on the cyber game and they're not connected to the non-cyber game, um, then in fact I think you'll, you, rec you can recognize there's a challenge. So it's a, it's a dangerous thing for us to separate them. So why do I have this? So you can say that's a, a cleared system or you can say that's a system that we're trying, you know, it's not classified, but we're trying the best, you know, someone's trying the best they can to keep that as locked up as possible. So that's, if you're a bad guy, so you're going to approach the people that are actually working on those systems. Uh, it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, I talked to a, a um, I won't tell you which government the guy was from, but he was for an intelligence officer a number of years ago. And um, I was asking him about classified information and him levying uh, his spies that were working for him. He was a case officer. And uh, um, do you levy them for classified information? And he's very quickly came back, smart guy, very smart guy. He came back and he goes, he's kind of laughed. And he says, well, we, we don't have to do that. And I said, what? And he goes, no, he says, all we have to do is go to Crystal City to meet our collection requirements. So he's talking about all he's got to do is go engage people on a human level and then draw, draw from them some, uh, some information. So and then what's, what else is exposed? Those people are typing on unclassified systems. Those systems are clearly exposed. So I would propose if you're a cyber person or a non-cyber person that you have to, whoop, those are, here are the issues, of course, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, 
right, the integrity, somebody might be exposed as they try to update the systems, and availability of the system may be a challenge because it may have been compromised in the first place. But that's a cyber game, and let's just stipulate that, that, that the cyber people can control that. And, and it's pretty impressive what I think takes place in general. The problem is, again, the, the blue box around it and then the green box around it. So I propose we need to think about the challenges being this. So if you're a cyber person, you have to be connected to the non-cyber people, at least from my perspective. I used to red team all the time on a human level. That was my job to compromise people, and it's a pretty easy thing if you use the right bait. So um, this, is a, this is, at least from my perspective, something that I would propose, uh, at least for this audience, um, uh, that I think is quite relevant as we talk about delivery on compromise. So major point is that. Uh, plus, delivering on compromise, from my perspective, it should be a goal. Um, we, I think we owe it to the taxpayer, a goal for the American government as well as for um, uh, when we pass it down and we're starting to use the industry capability. Um, think about compromise. What's more value, valuable, a compromised capability or an uncompromised capability? And how is it that we can actually put a dollar figure on it? Because I think that is what the future, in fact, holds. And again, finally, I think it's a giant vulnerability if we distinguish between cyber, if we don't consider non-cyber when we're thinking about cyber or vice versa. So those are very quickly my remarks. I, uh, uh, again, I deal with this stuff every day. And uh, it is fun, but it's quite often disappointing. So, so. That's great. Yeah. Sure. If anybody wants to ask anything. Two quick questions, maybe. Do we have any from the audience? If not, Bill will be around afterwards. So, no, you're all shy. Oh, we got one there. Sorry. Breaking down, you know, industry versus self. Is that self-reported, or how are you finding industry? Yeah. So cleared it. So I'll tell you. So, 15 percent. Those numbers, 15% of the facilities report something of a counterintelligence interest. 25% report something at all, okay? So we actually have a very rich, from my perspective, if you're looking, we actually have a very rich picture. Um, it, um, the, uh, the numbers that we have and what we can actually show and how our opponents are coming after us, et cetera. But the reality is it probably needs to be three or four times that much if for us to actually, that's what the analysts tell me, to statistically do a great deal of extrapolation. So you notice I wasn't talking about the threat is high, so I'm not characterizing it. What I'm saying is the reporting is high. So those categories that you saw, X number of reports, et cetera, compared to how many that company, the, that, the, uh, uh, that that particular company uh, provided. But industry does, from my perspective, a good job. The challenge is we have to incentivize where it's even far greater. If we're going to actually truly get to understand, get come to grips with the, the depth and breadth of the challenge. But so I have three and a half percent of the counterintelligence assets in the Department of Defense, and we have between according to which year between 19 and 29 percent of the reporting for the department. And so three and a half percent, but we get that much of the reporting. The reason is, is because we're dealing with the national treasure. The bad guys want that national treasure. They're less interested in getting onto XYZ Air Force Base than they are about taking that national treasure. So it's a rich opportunity. It's a great, it's a great, you know, great game to be in, actually, if you do what I do. So I mean, acquisition would be up here saying you're correct. All I'd propose is that how do we get the incentives correct so we can do that, right? That, that's what I would propose. Because yes, it's expensive. So I'm saying what's the difference between 80 uncompromised jets and 100 compromised jets? I mean, that's, I, that's how I would be thinking about the problem. It's not cheap. It's not, I, I think it's not going to be inexpensive. The thing is how, in fact, can we, you know, the point about Apple is, well, there's some people that think there's actually a, com a comparative advantage when they are actually playing that game. But uh, it's fully recognized, believe it or not, by the, the people, my boss, my boss's boss, and, how, and that, that, that challenge, how can we get that done too, is what, what it really amounts to.
we got time for one more question, and there was one in the front there. Do you still have it? Yeah. Wait, can you wait for the microphone? Sorry. <laughs> Should be working. Yes, we can hear <laughs> Wonders uh, of technology. So thanks for illuminating the challenge. Sure. And it sounds like you're suggesting there's a step function change in process, more is needed. Do you see the challenge greater within government, or do you see the challenge greater with the contractors? You mean in, in actually being willing to deliver on compromise? Willing and actually deliver. Okay. So, again, uh, not a not an IT guy, a military officer. I've seen the Americans operate in a lot of places. I've actually seen a lot of American business. Giant fan of American business. Uh, and if the incentives are correct, they'll deliver. That's my view. So it, uh, getting, getting, um, getting uh, the government to properly organize for it is what I think the government is in the process of doing, is what the department is in the process of actually doing. But I, my experience is if we ask and we incentivize American industry, they deliver. It, I know it sounds challenging, if they, but if we put the burden on them without getting, um, you know, changing the incentives, uh, you know, uh, they, react, they react according to where their cheese is. Okay. Anything else? That's a great, that's a great note Thank to you. end on. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Oops, if I could invite the panel to come up. While they're coming up, I'll introduce them. Uh, we have Tommy Ross, Senior Director for Privacy at the BSA, the Software Alliance. Uh, Roberta Stempley, Director, CERT Division, Carnegie Mellon University, Software Engineering Institute. Uh, Alan Friedman, Director of Cybersecurity Initiatives, National Telecommunications and Information, Inf Information Agency. Derek Weeks, uh, Vice President at Sonatype. And our closing remarks will by, be by Robert Metzger, who is co-author of the MITRE Deliver Uncompromised report and head of the DC office, Rogers Joseph O'Donnell, PC. So what I'm going to do is, uh, these are all friends. Uh, their bios are available on our website. I know who they are. Um, we will start with uh, Alan and Tommy to talk about what they're doing, and then we'll go down the row. So Tommy, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, so <coughs> I work for BSA, as Jim said. BSA is a global trade association representing the software industry. Apple is one of our members, so I was really happy to hear Bill acknowledge the great job they're doing in protecting their products. Um, it's actually pretty, pretty standard, I think, across BSA members um, to treat security and privacy both very seriously as they develop their products, and they've been innovating over many years, not just in the products themselves, but in how they approach security. So they um, are some of the companies behind the, the development and evolution of the secure development lifecycle and security de by design principles and so on. Um, Jim asked me to talk about what we're working on, and what that is is uh, something that we're going to publicly release next week. Unfortunately, we, we, we messed up the timing here with Jim's event. Um, but next week, we'll be releasing uh, a framework for secure software, which uh, I think you can think about like a NIST critical infrastructure cybersecurity framework, but targeted toward uh, software products and services. It's really built upon the lessons learned and best practices accumulated by our companies um, over the last uh, few decades um, in developing software and, and, and developing those, those secure development approaches that they, they've been honing. It's risk-based, outcome-focused, and internationally aligned uh, or aligned with international standards uh, like the NIST framework. And it's structured like the NIST framework with functions and categories and so on, but it gets down into a little bit uh, deeper level of technical detail in relation to software security. Supply chain risk management is a big part of the framework, and I can talk a little bit about what that looks like in our framework, but I think first it's, it's important to say, uh, often when we think about supply chain, it's, it's thinking about the suppliers downstream, um, how to manage the components that are being integrated into a product, and supply chain security for software is really broad, more broad than that, and you have to take a holistic approach in developing the, the software product and securing that product or service across its life cycle to prevent supply chain vulnerabilities and threats. 
Um, so I, uh, w for one example, you can do all you want to manage the third party components that are being integrated into a product to vet them, test them, secure them. But if you're not protecting the development environment in which the software is being developed, if you're not managing the, the access um, of, of uh, users in a way that prevents unauthorized access, then the entire, um, the, the entire production is, is vulnerable to exploitation. Uh, likewise, uh, supply chain threats can, can come through deployment architectures, through patching mechanisms, um, and things like that. Uh, and in fact, I mean, one of the, the bigger attacks in the last few years, not Petya, took, took um, originally took advantage of a, of a patching mechanism to um, wreak havoc worldwide. Uh, so our, our framework is really designed to treat security holistically across the product life cycle, but not just to think about process. Process is really important, but ultimately we need to think about the security capabilities of the product itself. And so that's what we will try to do in the framework that, that we'll release is blend together specific uh, diagnostic statements, statements that, that are um, specific enough to be hopefully measurable or, or, or used for assessing and describing security in software products, um, both with regard to the, the secure development life cycle and with regard to the capabilities of the security product itself. Uh, more specifically around supply chain management, I, I'd mentioned a few things that, that we emphasize in the framework. As I said, we cover a lot of ground and supply chain security does require that holistic approach. But uh, to call out a few things, uh, management of third party components is really important. And uh, we, we will, uh, the, the sort of standard we're seeking to set there is, is that software developers ought to be identifying and tracking those third party components that they integrate. Um, vetting them, vetting the vendors uh, or the suppliers of those, those components, um, and, and testing them as they go into the products and then testing the broader products themselves throughout their life cycle uh, to, to the extent feasible. And it's not always feasible, and we could talk about that, but th that is our goal, and I think it will align with some of the work that Alan is talking about um, in relation to software transparency. Um, second, pr protecting against counterfeiting and, and tampering. That's, that's fairly straightforward, I think. Um, but looking at things like code signing and anti-reverse engineering as, as, uh, as best practices that are really important in the space, unique identification markers for the software and so on. Um, and then third, uh, thinking about the suppliers themselves, as I said, vetting the vendors, but also something that, that we think is, we increasingly think is important and is reflected in some of the activities of our companies, um, enforcing security policies downstream uh, throughout the supply chain. So you, you, some of you may have heard about the Charter of Trust, which a couple of our members, Siemens and IBM, helped to develop um, and, and uh, put into place over the last couple years. One of the things that they're moving very quickly to do across the different signatories of the Charter is to identify supply chain security standards and enforce them on suppliers all the way through their supply chain. So if you want to be a part of the supply chain of Siemens or IBM, you have to comply with the standards that, that, that they're laying out. Um, that's something that, that all software developers can do with their suppliers um, through contracts and through other arrangements where they, where they have them um, in place with those suppliers um, or at minimum to be able to, to, to vet the suppliers themselves. Uh, so that's a handful of things uh, that, that I'd highlight from our software security framework. Obviously, we'll, uh, we'll be putting it out publicly next week, and, and, um, and, and you can see it for yourselves. Um, one thing I'd note very quickly is that there, there's one thing you won't see in our, our, our framework in relation to software security, and I want to highlight this because um, it, it, it's a conversation that I, I've, I've been hearing more frequently lately in, in relation to software supply chain security. And that's, you won't, see any, you won't see any discussion in our framework around software provenance, trying to control the, the, where the software is developed or the nationality of the people that, that work on it. Um, I, I, I'll crib from, from Director Stevens' uh, PowerPoint here. You know, he talked about how important innovation is uh, for the Department of Defense, and it's of course very important for the software industry and for all the industries that depend on software, which is most industries these, these days. And he talked about uh, recognizing that innovation is critical and asking what's the strategy for securing that innovation. And I think what we see with software provenance is that it, it, is, a, it is an approach to security that disrupts innovation rather than securing it, um, because it, it, it doesn't recognize the sort of multinational um, 
character of many supply chains, nor the, the, the prominent use of open source components. And ultimately, it doesn't do that much to protect security because risk, of course, comes from everywhere, not just particular countries that we may be concerned about. Um, so I, I, I would throw that out there as something that we ought to be sort of guarding against because it seems like potentially a, 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 a reasonable answer to supply chain security, but I think, I think causes more problems than, than it may solve. Thank you, Tommy. Alan, you've been leading an effort at NIST for quite a while. Can you tell us a little about that? Sure. So uh, I work for NTIA. We're the National Telecommunication oh, and Information Administration, a uh, very tiny <clears throat> part of the U.S. Department of Commerce. My general counsel likes it if I casually mention that we're the president's advisor on internet and telecom policy issues. Uh, but I think more broadly, our equity is sort of a free, open, and trustworthy digital ecosystem. So we try to think of the entire digital ecosystem and how do we maintain trust in it uh, across the economy. Uh, we've been focusing on what we call software component transparency. And as both Tommy Director Stephen said, um, transparency is one part of a complete breakfast. Right? Uh, <coughs> but like the box of cereal that is really the core of breakfast, um, this, in the supermarket, it comes with a list of ingredients. In fact, everything you buy that you could put in your body comes with a list of ingredients. There's nothing magical about that. Uh, transparency is part of how we do business across the entire economy. Uh, if you're dealing in chemicals, in any sector around the world, there are international standards around things called safety data sheets, where the chemicals that you're using, you have to sort of tell your customers in the supply chain, hey, this is what's inside, so you know what to do if there's a spill. Uh, and indeed, in all of industry, we come to expect a certain amount of transparency in the supply chain. If you buy an engine, it comes with what's called a bill of materials, right? Every nut, every bolt, so that you can maintain it, so that you know what to do when something goes wrong. However, the software that runs the modern engines on which we all depend, we don't have that level of transparency. And our approach here is to say, well, what does this software bill of materials look like? And rather than define it in a mandatory fashion, say it must be like this, we said, let's bring together folks from across the supply chain and say, hey, what would be useful to you? So it is an industry-led process. The analogy I use is the government pushes, but we don't steer. So multi-stakeholder, uh, we have folks from across the different supply, across the entire software supply chain. And that has really helped us get a good perspective on the nature of how transparency isn't just one person's job. It's something that can benefit all of us. So we have, we're tackling the what, the why, and the how. What is a software bill of materials? Well, at its core, it's saying, here's a piece of software, and its dependencies are these, right? Software isn't hewn out of alabaster marble by tonsured monks on Greek islands. It's something that comes from assembling parts. Code reuse is fundamental to how we think about software. So if I'm using third-party components, you may trust my software because you trust me. We have a contractual relationship. But you don't know what I'm putting in there. Is it fresh? Is it healthy? Or is it something that's perhaps past its sell-by date and has some vulnerabilities in it? The vision here is that we're going to, everyone is going to be saying, I will tell the person further down what I'm using. So we can recurse uh, and find out what that whole dependency tree looks like. So that's the basic. We can talk a little bit more about Providence uh, because I think there's some important things to dig into later. Uh, but the whys are also really important because this isn't just about security. This speaks to the entire notion of quality. Mm -hmm. There's a major American bank that today will ask for a bill of materials. Now, it may be given to them in a PDF form. They don't have the tools to sort of scan it to actually mine it for data. But if you can't produce a bill of materials, that's 10% off of your asking price before you even get to the contract. Because that says to them enough about the quality of your software and how much more expensive it's going to be for them to maintain it that they're going to say, we're not going to pay your full price. Uh, this notion of tracking what you ship is such a core notion of hygiene that we think, and we're very happy to see it in, in Tommy's work as well. So this is something that affects commercial software, it affects open source software, it affects people who are doing rapid DevOps style that uh, Derek spends a lot of time working with, and it's affecting classic folks who think about this uh, in sort of a plain old waterfall development shop. Uh, 
But more importantly is, perhaps most importantly, is how do we do it? Right? It's one thing if everyone gets behind this vision, but we need to make sure that this is machine readable and can be automated. And the vision here is to say, hey, listen, there are two standards out there that are developed for different reasons. Both of them are developed for licensing purposes. One from the commercial software world. It's an ISO standard called SWID. The other comes out of the open source world. It's called SPDX. Both of them are about tracking components of software. Hey, that's what we're looking for. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's use what's already out there. Uh, let's make sure that we can cross-translate between them so that we can start to actually build tooling so that as the software moves from a tiny library that's assembled into bigger libraries, that's assembled into bigger libraries, that's assembled into operating systems that are then used in embedded devices, we can actually track what these components are and make sure that this is something that's valued. The final component is our vision really is uh, that this should be market driven. That there is value across the entire supply chain. This is going to make it easier for people who make software for a living to support it because they know what they're shipping. It's going to help folks who are buying software because now they can actually do vulnerability management scanning under the hood. It's not just a black box. You can actually say, hey, while I'm waiting for my vendor to patch this vulnerability or to tell me whether or not it's vulnerable, I can take other mitigations to protect myself. Uh, so we think this is something that's going to be able to help across the ecosystem. There are some regulators waiting in the wings, uh, but what we want to do is make sure that this is something that makes sense for industry stakeholders today, even if it is picked up later on. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. That was great. Um, Bobby, do you want to tell us what's up at uh, CMU? Yeah, uh, happy to. So um, I work <coughs> at a Defense Department federally funded research and development center that's been around for about 30 years. It was created specifically to address the important issue of software in the Defense Department. And uh, you know, some 30 years ago, they, the Air Force said, oh, we think this software thing, it might be big, um, and, uh, and decided that maybe they needed to head, hit it head on. Um, and a bit after that, uh, something bad happened on the internet, uh, the Morris Worm, and they went, oh, this cyber thing, it might be important, we might need to do something about it. Um, and so we took on a, an additional set of responsibility in, uh, in computer security, cyber, uh, in cyberspace security. Um, and we now are also the federally funded research and development center focused on artificial intelligence. And so these things that are transformative to the internet itself, to our, our nation, um, are a part of our responsibility. So we are an applied research lab. I, I don't have a business, like uh, you are not a trade association. Um, I have the privilege of working with Alan on a, on a range of things. But we get to see things at, at and drive the transformation-related activities. And so this idea of, of supply chain management and software supply chain has been a real focus for us for a really long time. Um, and that's, it's great that it's got the attention that it has now, this linkage of quality to security, of uh, thinking about how software is developed today compared to how it was 30 years ago um, has been really our, our, our big focus um, to this point. So how we take advantage of and protect the development environments, right? The, what is the software factory itself? How do we transform to adopting software factories? How do we think about the capability that that factory provides us, not just to have machine readable, but to do machine producible, right? That's the, the nirvana for us is machine producibility um, as a part of it. And there's such tooling available in order to do that. So, and how do we protect that sort of holy grail how do we think about a world where um, data is the new software? Uh, we've had a long history of thinking about data security. If you remember, that's where cybersecurity started. And then we started evolving to protecting of enclaves and of containers of the data. Um, but in the, in the next generation of things we need to deal with, we're now dealing with data with the new software problem. Um, and how is it going to be uh, something we've got to really understand and wrap our head around uh, in that space. And then these things are going to go wrong. Right? Something's going to go badly, uh, whether it be a vulnerability is identified or exploited. How do we uh, s link these pieces together, link the piece of knowing what is in your environment to more adequately addressing your risk and responding more quickly? Um, and how do we inform decision makers how to think about these decisions. So we're, we're all about the how um, and how we do it quickly and, and effectively because a, a future world that, that we're 
largely in now means we have to increase the trustworthiness of every component, uh, regardless of, of what it is, where it is. Uh, we've got to realize that the lines between software and hardware are, I wouldn't go so far as to say blurred, but to say pretty much gone in, in so many instances. You think about, think about a world where we had uh, hardware defining everything. Now you have software defined networks, right? It was a hardware network. Now you have software defined networks, software defined everything. And for uh, speed purposes and efficiency purposes, you're now implementing that software in the hardware itself, right? Now it's firmware and more mechanisms. So, so what's the difference and how do we think about all of these component issues um, in that uh, sort of in that space? So that's uh, sort of the broad set of research we've got going on. Um, and then how do the operators be prepared for a world where all of this is real? Great, thank you. We were gonna call this event, uh, Software Cures All Ills, <laughs> which, which I actually believe. Uh, but uh, Derek, let me turn to you, please. Yeah, so uh, I'm Derek Weeks. I'm a vice president at Sonotype, uh, based here locally. In the DC area, uh, one of the reasons I'm on this panel is for the last five years, I've led and championed the uh, uh, report called the State of the Software Supply Chain Report. This is a report of uh, empirical data that, that we collect from uh, around the industry uh, and at Sonotype our, ourselves about what's happening in software development and software supply chains uh, around the world across hundreds of thousands of uh, organizations. I think the, um, you know, part of why we're here talking about software uh, supply chain and security uh, is that we are seeing our adversaries focus uh, more on this area uh, every single year. So Forrester uh, Research has uh, uh, recognized that the most successful attack vector leading to breach today is uh, applications. I run uh, an annual survey of software development teams, DevOps teams, software developers. Uh, this January, we touched 5,500 people in that survey. Uh, one in four said that their organizations had experienced a web application breach uh, within the last 12 months. 24% of those in the survey said that they had experienced an open source related breach uh, in their applications within the last 12 months. That is up 71% since 2014 when we had the Heartbleed open source uh, vulnerability uh, come into everyone's uh, uh, view uh, out in the market. So there is a big problem uh, that our software is under attack consistently uh, and we need to do something about it. When we look at software supply chains in general, I. You know, part of what I do in the report is I help people visualize what is happening in software development. And as Bobby said, how much it's changed uh, recently. And as Tommy said, you know, that we have the software supply chain and this software uh, manufacturing uh, process. Uh, in the world of software development, software is no longer written from scratch. It is assembled from open source components. An application being developed today is 90% uh, uh, of its footprint is open source components because a developer can download one of these parts from the internet in a second versus spend a week or a month writing, uh, writing this. Uh, to give you a sense of the scale at which this is, is happening, uh, in the last year just for Java developers, there are 9 million Java developers on the planet, those developers consumed 146 billion Java open source components last year. Uh, in the realm of JavaScript developers, there are six and a half million JavaScript developers around the world. They are consuming nine billion JavaScript packages every week within their software development practices. In the average enterprise, when I looked across 12,000 enterprises in this last year, I saw that the average enterprise is consuming about 300,000 Java open source components alone. So when you're an enterprise developing in Java, Ruby, Python, .NET, uh, what have you, you're consuming well over uh, half a million open source components a year from thousands of different suppliers out there within this, uh, this community. Uh, the, the good news is we're being incredibly efficient in our software development. 
Uh, the bad news is that out of all those components I just told you that were being consumed by the demand of these development organizations, one in 10 of those components had a known <laughs> security vulnerability the day it was downloaded into those organizations. Um, if you're unfortunate enough to have JavaScript developers uh, as part of your supply chain, uh, an analysis by that group just in the last October said 51% of their packages have known vulnerabilities that are being downloaded uh, by development teams out there. Uh, so the risk is substantial, but the risk is getting even greater And that uh, one, one thing, I've been doing this report for five years, the most worrisome thing that uh, I've seen, uh, and Bob may touch on this in the uh, deliver uncompromised view of things because they reported on it as well as the malicious code injections into open source projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen and detailed, I think, 14 different instances of this over the last uh, 18 months or so. Uh, one of the more recent ones being in November, uh, a JavaScript component was, uh, was compromised uh, by someone that was uh, took over so socially engineered uh, commit uh, role uh, into this project. Uh, inserted malicious code into this. That piece of code is downloaded half a million times a week by developers uh, around the world. Uh, this uh, ability to inject malicious code into the very beginning of the supply chain is like someone in the Tylenol factory uh, uh, injecting cyanide into the pills at the, at the factory level. It used to be in the case of Equifax, someone would have to wait for a new vulnerability to be uh, introduced or discovered, and then the adversaries would uh, run after that and find the exploits. Now the adversaries are actually instrumenting the open source itself from the beginning of the supply chain to uh, make us vulnerable. I think as an industry, uh, we have a, a forum here to discuss whether we approach having industry uh, take action to make themselves uh, better, as uh, Director Stevens said, uh, that industry can take this upon themselves, or we have to look at uh, the opportunity to introduce legislation and software liability uh, in this area to protect consumers, uh, because there is no manufacturing, major manufacturing industry on the planet where you can ship known defective parts <laughs> in products to consumers uh, and do that legally. Uh, you can't ship a known defective Takata airbag in a, in a car today, uh, but you can in software development. You can ship known defective, uh, non-secure uh, parts in software development today, and I think that has to change. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. That was great. No. <laughs> um, well, that was a lot to take in. All the panelists have been great. And so fortunately, I don't have to do it. Uh, Robert gets to bad cleanup. So Robert, may we so turn to you? I am the only lawyer in the group, uh, which is ordinarily a bad thing for audiences like this, but I'm hoping to overcome your suspicions. Uh, I am one of the co-authors of Deliver Uncompromised, uh, which I did as a consultant for the MITRE Corporation. I continue to act as a consultant for MITRE and continue to support uh, areas of software assurance for the Department of Defense. Uh, before being on the uh, study team, uh, I was also on the Defense Science Board Cyber Supply Chain Study, where we did look then, a few years ago, at risks of uh, clever corruption of the sources of software and some of the downstream implications. Deliver and Compromised is uh, it's not a perfect document, um, it does assemble, I think, effectively a lot of ideas that have uh, individual merit, and it attempts with some, some achievement to take a holistic view of security uh, across uh, the Department of Defense and going beyond that, uh, looking towards the industry that supports the federal government. It's not a pretty picture. Um, Bill Stevens himself was the author of the core definition of deliver and compromise, which I'll read for a specific purpose. For mission owners, the primary goal of DOD must be to deliver war fighting capabilities to operating forces without their critical information and or technology 
being wittingly or unwittingly lost, stolen, denied, degraded, or inappropriately given away or sold. Now, if we consider that only in the context of software, if we think not at all about firmware, if we ignore hardware, if we think of the many areas of vulnerability that can be created, exploited, delivered, or have consequence through software, it's a very troubling picture. You know, so much of industry has been focused upon essentially one threat vector we discuss in the report, and that is cyber IT, the protection of information and information systems or the preoccupation upon perimeter security and often a concentration on premises security. I could make a pretty good argument that that is looking at the top of the tip of the iceberg because increasingly for critical infrastructure, key government functions, much of industry, consumer functions, and much of the Department of Defense, mission systems, and weapon systems, software defines functionality and software is in a constant change, constant state of flux and change. And that flux and change is, uh, as Derek mentioned, draws upon almost a, an incalculable number of sources, some of which are known and many of which are not. And so as adversaries look to find ways to uh, seek vulnerabilities and then to exploit them in, uh, through means that ha are difficult to attribute, we're very concerned that software will become the attack vector of choice and it is difficult to set limits upon the potential consequences or their severity. Uh, I think all of the authors of Deliver and Compromise uh, would agree that it is essential that DOD be more alert to and change its acquisition methods and operations to better protect software and also to have better contemplation that software will be attacked so that remediation is given a higher elevation in planning and a better success rate in action. I also think it's uh, important uh, for us to appreciate this issue of pedigree and provenance. I was very interested in, it in Tommy's comment that the software framework is, it is not uh, taking a positive view on, on provenance. And I understand the argument that software has international sources and that it's often difficult to know who they are. And I appreciate that the fact that, a, that a, a, an author of a particular software component may not be in the US is not itself an indicator, much less establishing the insecurity of that component. However, I can also say with complete certainty that there are many people in the Department of Defense who worry a great deal about both pedigree and provenance of software. And here I use pedigree to describe what we know about the author of the software and who has influence, control over them or could cause them to take actions that corrupt their software or otherwise do us injury. But we're, in, we're interested in more than just the pedigree, that is the who. We are interested in the chain of custody that follows the provenance. Provenance is what allows us to understand what transpires after the authorship of a particular code segment and the time in which it is installed in your system or your device. And it is felt within the Department of Defense that it is important to know as much as we can about both pedigree and provenance. Now that said, it's also recognized by many that software <coughs> today is built in a different way than it was a few years ago. And it's also one of, one of the features of Allen's effort is to create uh, standards for a software bill of material. And accompanying those standards are tags, such as SWID, which would give you reliable information as to both pedigree and provenance. We can't invent those tags and apply them to software that is already in being. It won't happen we still can get great value out of a software bill of material because that bill of material can tell us an awful lot about the components that were collected and how they were assembled. It can give us at least indicators as to the reliability or version. Sometimes a software bill of material can give us key information on license rights, which actually figures into both commercial and DOD use. It can also give us essentially the crucial inventory of what we have in our deployed software 
so that we can close what I think Eric and or Alan would agree has sometimes been called the Equifax gap. And the Equifax gap, of course, involved a, a, a corruption of uh, an Apache Struts uh, software module. And as I recall the chronology, the, there was a CVE uh, produced as to the Apache Struts vulnerability on, say, day one in March. It took several months before Equifax actually corrected that vulnerability in its system, and even a longer time before Equifax admitted it. The problem was that it took the adversaries, if I remember correctly, three days, three days <laughs> between the publication of the CVE and their exploit of it to, ex to exfiltrate 150 million protected records. It is crucial to the Department of Defense and I think to industry as well to close that gap. We must have a means of being able to monitor CVE and know, identify the nature, composition, source, and risk of software components using automated means so that when CVEs or CWEs or reports to CERT or even classified sources identify <coughs> software exposure or particular components that have been corrupted, where we, able, where we know when we have the components that are installed in our systems and we are able to act upon those rapidly. That is going to be a tall order. And getting back to the framework notion, there is no way that we are going to go from our present state of software assurance to what we want instantly or without pain, cost, and difficulty. I'm not, in all circumstances, a giant fan of the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. To me, sometimes it lacks kind of granularity or particularity or specifics as to what you're supposed to do or how you're actually supposed to measure yourself reliably. But there is one aspect of the framework that I do like, and that is the notion that there are tiers, which begin at the tier zero, practically knowing very little about your security, and finishing at tier four, which is an agile enterprise able to understand and act rapidly upon what it knows to be its true security status. We have to think about software assurance for DOD and for industry, for critical infrastructure as well, as something where we need to get started with projects to do better, to find better tools, to test and evaluate the actual uses of SBOM, to to marry SBOMs to automated systems that will collect in vulnerability information and produce indicators of risk or instructions for action. We're not going to get it right. There are going to be sources of objection, but we cannot be in another situation where the threat vastly outpaces our ability to take responsible actions in, in reaction and to recover. Now, going quickly through the MITRE report, there are 15 causes of, of action in the report. There are three of those that specifically address software assurance, and it figures prominently into another five. <coughs> COA 7 is to establish independently implemented automated assessment and continuous monitoring of DIB software. COA 9 is to ensure supplier security and use of extra, that's, that's the second tier one. COA 12 is to institute industry standard IT practices in all software development, secure software development lifecycle. Number 13 is to reduce vulnerability monitoring, coordinating, and sharing across the supply chain, chain of command. There are another five of the recommendations in the MITRE report in which software figures prominently. And the most, I guess, the most important is the first. We urge that security become a fourth pillar, given equal importance to cost, schedule, and performance in the planning for acquisition, in the conduct of procurement, in the operation of systems, and in their sustainment. We're not going to achieve the security we want unless software is given elevated importance throughout its entire life cycle as applied to each system. We also urge in our second recommendation a whole of government approach towards the collection, aggregation, analysis, and distribution of threat and vulnerability information. It strikes us as the report authors that there's this widely used formula that risk is a function of threat and vulnerability and consequence uh, alleviated or attenuated by what you might do for mitigation. 
But so often when it comes to industry, whether it be software developers or system developers, they know next to nothing about the threat. Now, DSS, of course, does supply cleared contractors with threat information. But the sources of software and the number of suppliers in the defense industrial base number in the tens of thousands, most of whom get no, no threat information as such. They may get vulnerability information, but it tends to be that provided by the commercial source of a scanning software. They may have little knowledge of the impact of a successful attack upon their system. This idea of the NSIC is to recognize that there is a broad community that has an interest in knowing more and knowing it faster and having actionable recommendations produced so that if a vulnerability is discovered, we will know where it affects the software installed in your system and we will be able to rapidly disseminate instructions has to mitigate that risk, close that vulnerability or remediate the gap. I'd urge you to, to take a look uh, at the report. It doesn't present a pretty picture of security and there is no reason to think that the situation is getting better today. However, I think the report does a good job in collecting key propositions that can be pursued by the technical community, by software developers, by system developers, solution providers, and by those in the government who are responsible for our national defense and the preservation and protection of our critical infrastructure. Great, thank you. So what we're going to do now is move to questions. Uh, Director Stevens, if you want to come back up to the stage, that'd be great. Um, we'll bounce between your questions and letting the panel shoot at each other. The only ground rule is we cannot all be mean to Tommy as the only <laughs> private sector <laughs> representative. But other than that, do we have questions? We have, uh, we have two. Lynn, go ahead, please. Wait for the microphone, if you wouldn't mind. There's been a lot of controversy and discussion about what the insurance industry is doing about uh, securing uh, cyber through insurance methodologies. Uh, there's a recent report out about Marsh and a consortium with the insurance industry of creating a lab to test software and be able to validate that it has the measures and structure in place. That's a great concept, but what do you see as far as it moving forward? Because every time an update is done, it creates the entire new set of vulnerabilities. It's going to require every new update to software having the same testing regime to be able to ensure that new vulnerabilities aren't in instituted. Okay, great, thank you. Alan, do you wanna go first? And then? So my first year of grad school was the first workshop on the economics of information security back in 2002. Uh, that was also the first time I saw a headline that sci this is the year of cyber insurance. Uh, and <laughs> I should probably interrupt myself and say, I'm gonna take my Department of Commerce hat off uh, not, these views do not represent the views of the department. Uh, but I think it is, it has been, um, the, we have put our faith in the insurance industry to solve this for a while because it makes sense. Right? Let's concentrate all the risk and, and they'll fix it for us. And of course, as you point out, uh, trusted third parties are sort of the deus ex machina of every security system. There simply isn't an approach. One of them is the certification story. Certification in insurance works against static risk. My mattress doesn't stay up all night trying to find new ways to catch on fire. Uh, you know, test something. Windows 7 used to be secure. It's not anymore. Uh, so I'm not wildly optimistic about any particular initiative, but every time we try it, I think we get a little bit closer, especially as we start to realize that there shouldn't be some massive cyber policy, right? There's no such thing as the cyber risk. And so one of the things that makes me quite heartened is policies are starting to get a lot more specific about what they're covering because that way they can actually say, what are the protections that we're going to try to push in place that we can actually monitor and get some uh, return on investment from them. And for whom does that best work? Yes. Right. Robert, yeah. did you want to? So, oh, I'm sorry. In our report, we, we put a lot of emphasis upon private sector <clears throat> forces, such as tax credits, perhaps, or private insurance as moving industry for good business reasons to improve security. And insurance has a, a role to play there, but it has to be a role that delivers the goods when it's called upon. And just in the last few days, there have been several reports of situations where one international law firm and one major industrial company, no, actually shipping company, uh, thought that they had coverage 
for the consequences of a successful cyber attack only to find that one or several insurers have invoked the act of war clause to deny liability. I understand the theory and the reasoning. It is that uh, the, the most sophisticated and dangerous attacks can be nation sponsored, nation initiated, or nation tolerated, and all those things get us into the gray area of contemporary cyber conflict where there's certainly some fingerprints on nation states even if you can't uh, prove they did it by design. But for insurance to work, it has to be something that companies know how to qualify for it and have confidence that if they do that, they will get the benefits of that policy so that there will be an actual reduction in the risk and in the liability that they face. And right now, I think it's going to be hard to do because I'm not sure that the standards exist yet. Perhaps the BSA framework will help so that there is a, a knowable basis to appreciate and execute the proper practices and methods for secure software development and for the sustainment and maintenance of that software in an agile or DevSecOps environment. When we have those things better documented, then I think insurance can play a role that's more useful. As a final and quick comment, I, I want to follow up on a point that uh, Bill made earlier, the, roles of, the role of liability. One of the things that struck us in the MITRE study is interesting is that software now is critical to function everywhere and almost for everything. And yet it remains an industry practice that software developers routinely disclaim liability for the flaws in their software, sometimes through the con modern counterpart to a shrink wrap agreement, the end use license agreement. I know there are good reasons for this and I know this is an issue of great sensitivity. But if software developers truly feel that by a contract clause or a warranty term that they are off the hook for bad practices no matter how bad, well, we're not really using conventional market forces to discipline the behavior of those who could do better. I like the idea of safe harbors so that when there are good practices, people will get in that safe harbor and know they are protected. But I don't like the idea of wholesale exclusion from liability. How about if we do Derek and then Tommy last? Yeah, uh, well, I think uh, Bob covered it uh, <coughs> very well, but I, I, I think the, um, and I'm no insurance expert, but when, it, when I look at I insurance, I think about uh, situations that are unpredictable, uncertain, or unwitting uh, behavior. I think where there are cases where uh, organizations uh, are putting known vulnerable uh, pieces of software into applications and shipping them, uh, that, that is, uh, it is unwitting behavior, but it is uh, knowable information. Uh, there is a way to identify what we are using. The, the efforts uh, you know, it, at, uh, with, that Alan is leading up to help us uh, as an industry uh, better identify the standards for um, how to create the, the SBOM. SBOMs are creatable. An SBOM for any application can take about 10 seconds to create. It is not complicated whatsoever, um, but we have to take the effort to do those. And I think if we take the effort to, uh, to do those and produce those, then we can knowingly understand what we're putting into the, the software. Uh, and, and then in that case, uh, if you know what you're putting into the software uh, and you're putting bad things, then liability should come into play, uh, that you shouldn't have this blanket uh, you know, protection of saying we can do whatever we want and put whatever we want in the software and not be liable. Okay, Tommy, this is your chance. <laughs> well, sure. I, I, I was just going to add a little context to the question because <clears throat> I think it's a great question and I think, I think you laid out an, an, an important premise there, which is that, that testing-based approaches don't necessarily fit with, with modern software. And, and just for context, uh, we, we've talked to, to software developers that tell us that they push out thousands plural of updates to their software a day. Mm -hmm. So if you test it at the beginning of the day, you're thousands of versions behind by the end of the day. Um, so a testing-based approach obviously doesn't make a lot of sense there. I, I think that we need to, to, to think about how we can combine testing of certain aspects of software with attestation, description, 
and documentation of, of how um, security approaches, of how software developers are, are approaching security. Um, to give an example, I mean, I think you can test a product for known vulnerabilities on the, on the day or at the, the version you're at, and that's important, but understanding the process that the company or the vendor, or the developer has in place to identify, test for, mitigate um, vulnerabilities and learn from those vulnerabilities in the development process is probably more important than the snapshot of whether they have any known vulnerabilities at that given time. And that's something you get not by testing, but more by attestation, description, or, or documentation. I think this um, is a whole another conversation about how high velocity software development changes how you think about security. Yeah. So that's a, a, a whole other conversation. But, but one of the interesting things about insurance that I think think we have to remember. It is an instrument and a tool, uh, agreed. But security is a people problem. People problems don't scale. And so we have to find intervention points to gain traction. And the insurance industry is an intervention point. Whether or not the, you know, setting the policy and liability question aside, they deal with small businesses and can be an incredibly powerful way to grow um, understanding of what needs to be done and actual movement along that that space as well and so we should remember that that there's a place for the instrument of insurance but the institutions of these groups can be helpful in ways we wouldn't traditionally have thought either let's let's go to the next question I think it's working. We have two. We it's have not three. for the mic, it's for the webcast. Yeah. Yes, um, God, I came here and I feel, I'm part of the Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management Office, and I did the ISR back office open source, and I wish I had never gone down the path. It's almost as if we figured out ways globally to pave roads quickly and then say, but the potholes keep coming up all the time. We have a addiction to patching. There's a book, book out, good to great, written a long time ago. And I think if we're willing to invest in the hardware, because hardware is important, Providence is important, and we have to recognize the culture of our institutions want to build knowledge bases and innovation, but they have no continuity of the end-to-end -end data strategy that says, what are you going to do? What is your response cycle? And how are you going to leverage? We have all these cyber test ranges now what you need to measure, as in the continuous process industry, environment, system, and human. I can stop failure 90% of the time in any plant, in anywhere in the world, because I see the patterns of failure before they occur. So is there a way to get to that continuous process for cyber, where we're seeing the patterns of failure before they occur and respond? And how do we get there? How do we get to those measurement systems? Because if we don't do that, then it's just a bunch of talk and knowledge bases, and we're always reacting way too slow. Why don't we go down the row if people want? <laughs> and again, I'm, I'm gonna go back to, we can't solve to cybers, uh, but I think we can drill into very particular areas. So I'm looking at this narrow area of tracking software, that's part of a much bigger picture. The DU report is great. Uh, today, we're focusing on saying, how do we get things started? If we try to make it perfect, it's gonna take us forever. So let's just focus on tracking components of software. Part of that says we're gonna build in the ability to have extensions for things like pedigree and provenance. And I wanna to speak to that just for a moment because I think one, if you're confused about the difference, I like the analogy of a rescue puppy. Pedigree is what you think kind of dogs are in it and Providence is what poor things happened to this creature before you got it. Uh, and, and they're important to track, and I think we can get there. But what I want to think about is once we have the technology, let's talk about the incentives. Because it's one thing to ask Tommy's members to say, hey, by the way, every single software library, not the ones you're using, but the ones they're using, the ones they're using all the way down the tree, you need to know exactly who touched it and what they did. That is raising the cost. And by the way, we're duplicating the crap out of the effort, right? If you want every single person who touches software to do that, you have now imposed a giant cost across the entire ecosystem. Or everyone can just give you, hey, here are all the libraries we're using. 
We use some automation to say, all right, what are actually the key ones that are at risk? And you know what, by the way, if there's a tiny little library that was stable for five years, and then someone pushed a bunch of code behind a Tor, a Tor exit node, yeah, we should know about that. And we should pay attention to that. That is a counterintelligence role. And so that's why I like this idea of saying, let's build a platform of data, you know, almost the CVE, but the next step forward. And then the folks who want to care about it, which by the way, high assurance, we've got the head of counterintelligence here, but there are a lot of folks in industry who want to do it. And then they go to our friends in the source composition analysis industry who say, hey, you can find out what's in it. That's part of the bill of materials. But what does it mean? Well, they've got the expertise. So we have patterns of failure in a lot of places. Um, and it starts with building high quality components to begin with. Right? That's, a, that's sort of a foundation given. Um, and so the idea of quality as a part of what we're doing, I think, is, is an important piece because that reduces the things you have to deal with on the other end. Um, so I agree, we have to break it into a number of parts. And I think we have. There are, there are different pieces. The world is getting much more complex. How we build software is changing, changed rapidly and isn't done changing um, in, um, in that space. And so how we teach people how to build high quality things from the beginning, I think, is, is an important part of it. But I think we always have to remember that even when we do, you know, in the day of nirvana, when we have done all of that right, the adversary is looking for every design trade we make, right? And you have to make design trades. It, it is the engineering principle that we live within, um, whether it's cost or it's power or it's time or it's schedule. We're going to make a design trade. And that's the thing the adversary is looking for. And so we're never going to get to a world, even when we have nirvana, um, where we aren't going to have uh, a failure mode that we have to deal with. Yeah, I, you know, I think uh, building off a lot of what the other panelists have said uh, on this, as, as software development and the software supply chains that feed software development become more like manufacturing, there is a lot that we can learn in the software development industry from manufacturing processes and manufacturing supply chain management in other industries. The idea of the SBOM is not a software specific thing. It comes from the bill of materials in manufacturing. The idea that when you take the SBOM and you understand what parts are in it, the thing that you want to do with that SBOM is better understand and track and trace where all of those parts are going. So when my car had a Takata airbag in it, the manufacturer knows that they put a Takata airbag in my make, model, year vehicle uh, that went to this dealer that was bought by this consumer and they can identify or notify that consumer there's a problem, we need to do the, this effective recall. So there are things, that, there are methods like track and trace that can be automated in modern software development to help uh, improve the secure uh, software development uh, practices. There's also uh, one thing that, that uh, Bobby brought up before was the um, machine producibility of uh, information. As you know, all of these known uh, identifiable parts are moving through software uh, supply chains and software development practices, we can use machines to identify those parts to recognize those parts for known vulnerabilities uh, in a built-in way that moves at the velocity of development and is not bolted on at the end of the development process in a manual way that could not keep up with how software development was, is made 10 years ago. Right. It, it, and you know, when I said there were 146 billion download components uh, or billion downloads of Java open source components, Five years ago, when I started at Sonotype and started looking at this, there were 13 billion. The consumption patterns are going up astronomically, but the automation that comes along with modern software development practices can enable us to keep up if we apply it in the right way and if we take lessons from other manufacturing industries on what they're doing in terms of bill of materials, track and trace, understanding defects, knowing who the consumers are, and being able to remediate 
but take uh, advantage of the machines uh, that are helping us do this to do it even faster and at scale. I have, I have to admit that uh, sometimes when uh, Bobby and Derek talk, I feel like the job here is being damage control on the Titanic. <laughs> uh, but, but so I'm glad you ended on a positive note. Because <laughs> imagine catching it commit, right? Just, yeah. With yeah. enough yeah. mops. I like that. Yeah. And, yeah. and then the, we're, you know, if you, if you catch yeah. it commit and then feed the, the value proposition back into the open source enterprise, that can be an automated system now. There's so. even an IDE today, talk about left of boom, there's an IDE today that will, as you're typing, will flag against it. Now, there, there's a challenge here, by the way, which is... We're saving we, the Titanic for you, Tim. Yes. We, we overstate vulnerability. Uh, one of the, I think, fair pushbacks against the notion of software bill of materials is there are plenty of vulnerabilities that are not immediately exploitable or exploitable at all, right? OpenSSL has over 600 function calls. Two of them get your heart bleed. Uh, there are lots of reasons why you don't want to update your code every time a vulnerability is found. Uh, that's one of the things that we're working to build into software bill of, bill of materials today is to allow vendors, suppliers to say, hey, by the way, we know this is going to set off a warning light. Uh, we're going to tell you that it is not exploitable. And that, I think, gets us down the road in a bunch of different directions, not least of which is reducing support costs for both the people who are defending systems and the people who are building systems. That's good business. And anytime you can make a security decision that actually saves money, well, that's really a rare win. I think there are also things from you know, supply chain management that, that we can pick off, like, okay, you're using open source. You have uh, on average, any enterprise out there is relying on 3,500 to 5,500 outside uh, open source projects to uh, help them with software development. Th th those projects are the ones that coded as the suppliers. But just as Takata or, or, or I'm sorry, uh, Toyota or Pfizer or Coca-Cola or John Deere is relying on a supplier network, they know who the best suppliers are. And they know the track records of those suppliers. And those kind of characteristics or attributes are identifiable. And we can apply that same thing to software development. So if you're gonna use these parts that are free, freely downloadable from the internet, you can look at who are the best suppliers and work those into your supply chain so that you're less vulnerable from the start because you're using the highest quality parts out there. Yeah, I, I think it's a great point. And it goes back to what I was saying before about enforcing security policies down the supply chain as well, not just um, relying on the best vendors, but making sure you're clear about your expectations um, for the security practices that they put in place in their component development. Um, I, let me say a few words about Providence since uh, Alan and Robert are picking on me a little bit. I, I actually agree with them. Um, I actually agree with, with, with the notion of, of collecting information about pedigree and Providence and using it as, as in, in a risk-based way. Uh, I think what I'm reacting to are, are conversations about crafting policies broadly around po provenance to say, you know, it, it is too risky and therefore we, sh we will not buy software that is made in China or made in Russia or made in some other country, or we will not even buy software that, is, um, that, that has components that a foreign national from one of these countries we may be concerned about worked on. Um, that, speaking of overbroad definition of vulnerability, um, really, really doesn't make a lot of sense in a market where uh, there, there is good software, innovative software coming from all over the place and there's a race um, globally to get uh, the most innovative products and the most innovative um, talent working on those products. Um, so I think, I, I think there is a, 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 a way to look at provenance that, that doesn't go too far down that, that path. Um, finally, I, in response to the question, I'd just say I think the, the secure development li uh, life cycle approach really is um, intended, as, as the best practice literature is developing, is really intended to um, learn from itself, to be, a, to be a constantly improving process that takes information about vulnerabilities that are found and feeds them back to the, um, to the development teams in ways that can be um, that, that can help them adjust the process. And more sophisticated software developers um, collect metrics about the, the vulnerabilities and, and where they're arising from and how they take shape and so on, and use those, uh, those metrics to reshape the secure development lifecycle process. I think, that, I think there's a lot of um, benefit from that. The problem is that there, 
there, uh, historically at least, I think this is changing, but historically there, it, customers have not had a whole lot of interest in whether somebody follows a secure development lifecycle or not. And I think that's something that, that um, we can do through, uh, through market forces, um, including the government's procurement, to, to change, to, to, to really drive attention to whether uh, we are buying software products that are, that are produced um, according to a process that builds security in from the beginning. So I agree with, with much of what's been said, and, and we've really illustrated a fairly wide range of tools, tactics, and procedures to improve software security. That's good. Uh, sometimes I, I think of this as a configuration management problem. Uh, in order to actually understand what you have and what is exposed, when it is vulnerable, and what you do, well, you got to you want to do a couple things. First, you want to narrow the list of the people you buy it from so that you're less exposed to any of those problems. That gets into traditional supply chain measures, the, the who component. And then I think there's a, a place, of course, for an SBOM because it can give you a better inventory of what you are, in fact, using that was created or drawn from open source. And I think the SBOM can distill to just three things that are useful, the things you know, the things you know you don't know, and areas that are obscure. And there are actions that can be indicated that flow from each of those characterizations. If it's a critical system and you have doubts about the process or integrity or the attestation of the software source, you will be very interested in the key components where their pedigree and provenance are neither known nor knowable because you may want to take measures unique to your system to protect against those being the path or cause of exploit. You may want to have them redone or re-engineered by a highly reliable source. But I also agree with the vital importance of having automated methods and deploying them at each place where they can help. The software problem is almost incalculable in both scale and speed. And the only way that we're going to address it successfully is to build, test, verify, evolve, and utilize tools that accelerate our understanding of vulnerabilities, our recognition of weaknesses, vulnerabilities, other exposures, the distribution of information about them, and the remediation through patch or other methods when they are found. If we can't come up with automated means to do it, we're going to find, once again, that the success of adversaries greatly outpaces our defenses, even if, as is clear here, we appreciate today the threat vector. And we've talked a lot about adversary success, but another thing that I, I hope the panel would agree with me on is as we move to a world where we will all rely on devices, the devices will be networked, they'll all be software defined. It's not just, it's not just adversary action, it's going to be public safety. Absolutely. Because so, you will depend on your car, or your refrigerator, whatever not going off the rails. We have time for two quick questions um, while we have three hands. We have time for three really quick questions <laughs> if the panelists can uh, keep it short. Can we get one in the back and then we'll move up to the front? So just a real quick one. Well, thank you for taking the time to discuss this amazing and critical issue. Could you talk about the supply chain implications of you know, uh, old code in new platforms or new code in old platforms? Yeah, uh, I think Bob touched on this earlier that it, it's uh, it's going to be challenging to look at all of the legacy software out there and apply new standards to how we manage that because there's so much of it out there and the people that were responsible for a lot of it might no longer exist at that uh, enterprise uh, and especially when you look at some resumes out there and they've uh, moved places from you know every two years they're moving on um, so that you know the life of that software and trackability of who did what on it uh, becomes even more difficult uh, over time uh, interestingly enough uh, from an open source perspective when I get to see and investigate um, thousands of different uh, applications and enterprises out there um, while there are um, 10,000 new 
open source component versions released every single day for developers, the newest, latest, greatest version of, uh, of those components being released. Uh, developers like to use what has worked for them uh, consistently for a long time. So uh, there are organizations developing software today that are putting in open source components that were developed in 2006 or 2008. I mean, these things are old. They're reliable for the software developer. And in some cases, those same components uh, have been known vulnerable for 10 years. So the idea of when I, when I hear that question of new software versus old software, the amount of old open source components going into brand new software uh, is considerable. Uh, and it might be, you know, I, I have the research, but I don't have the numbers off of my head, uh, the top of my head, but 25% uh, of, uh, of a current new software package could be components five years or, or older. And Bob talked about the need to measure uncertainty. We have tools today uh, that will actually unpack compiled binaries and speculate on what might be there. And that can get us to sort of a better risk posture to at least know, hey, this is how I'm going to tune the systems around it. Uh, and you know, we're seeing this come up in uh, the medical device community. So we have three working groups that are just talking. The one group that is actually building a proof of concept for SBOM today is happening in the medical device community because, as Jim said, those are lives on the line. But I think the important thing there is speculate, right? Yes. But getting from speculate to fact risky, oh yeah. is an incredibly difficult mathematical and computer <laughs> science problem. Okay, we had one in the front. Right. So going back to the <clears throat> MITRE report in the classified information sharing issue, which was also an issue brought up in a congressional hearing a couple of weeks ago, how do you see the government taking a more active role in bridging that information gap, especially for smaller companies who may deal with sensitive information but not classified? and for those companies who may not have the financial or administrative means for those cybersecurity measures? I'll start, maybe Bill, you'll want to comment on this. So uh, in the MITRE report, we, we drew an analogy to the National Counterterrorism Center, which was formed after 9-11. I'm told that, that before NCTC was formed, there were all sorts of law enforcement agencies in all different places within the executive branch all of whom were interested and concerned about and had some responsibility for counterterrorism, but there was no single place where the relevant threat information was collected and where actions were decided upon collectively uh, and then taken. And I, I don't have personal knowledge of NCTC, but I've been given to believe that it has been effective in its function. So the theory of the MITRE report was that we have Title 10 and Title 15, sorry, Title 10, Title 18, Title 50 agencies, plus the regulatory agencies, plus the civilian agencies, and all, everyone in each of those, eight, there are many people in each of those agencies that have a reason to care, can collect knowledge, and if we create an enterprise where that knowledge is aggregated, we can not only process it effectively, but find ways in which to distribute it that reflect our trust in the security of the party to whom we are sharing it. Class of cleared contractors would get more, more sophisticated cleared contractors, more still. But we thought it was possible to come up with useful and actionable recommendations, even for small companies where they're not cleared, but they are exposed to a known threat. So the cybersecurity game is controlled in the department by what we're dealing with is, sorry, what we're dealing with is, of course, you know, classified information. We do have an unclassified report that we put out annually. It's not, it's not, you know, obviously not focused uh, just on, just on software. I will tell you, it, it is a challenge. Uh, even classified information that we have, for us to transmit, um, for us to be able to get uh, classified threat information to people who are cleared, in an information age way is very challenging for the Department of Defense, right? And I'll tell you what we do, again, this is the classified stuff. We have um, a number of firms that actually sit in our spaces. We pioneered that. They literally physically sit in our spaces. They're able to read traffic, at least some of it, uh, as, they, as they sit there. And we were able to bring some people in. And the reason we do that is so we can literally say, well, here's a challenge. Now you have it, right? Physically hand it to them quickly. Otherwise, right now, we wrap it physically take it to them. Okay. Now the only other thing that we do have is we have a classified uh, 
BTC every month, and we have probably 500 people across the United States participate in that, so that was, for us, that was pioneering. Any three-letter agency that you can think of, the United States has actually stood there and briefed across the United States for the firms that are engaged in classified work. So it's not a very uh, good answer, but... But, but I, I think that. the information sharing regimes that have been established for operational cyber-related data oftentimes go to organizations who could expand that connection to the kind of information we're talking about here, right? The DOD CIO runs an information sharing regime with the cleared defense contractors. It's That's generally true. oriented towards operational data. These are the same people who run mature software factories. And so the, the ability to connect to the supply chain component of that uh, is, could be useful instead of building a whole new regime that now has to compete for resources, attention, and engagement. We had one uh, question in the back. <clears throat> this is what we used to call sneaker net, by the way. Uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. Uh, you, uh, I think Robert mentioned four pillars in the procurement process of the DOD, and one of them would be able to be uh, survivable in a cyber environment. Uh, the problem that I can't understand is you can measure cost and schedule and performance how would one measure in a DOD procurement uh, cyber uh, protection? That's a great question. Uh, it's, it's easy to make some of the recommendations in the report. I'm finding that it's hard to implement most of them, sometimes extremely hard. Uh, you know, we talk about making security a fourth pillar in order for that to be achieved. Several people have mentioned that security costs money and software security costs money and we have to expect to spend for it. But on the issue of measurement, the, the idea of the MITRE report was that we could create uh, an independent expert entity to do assessments of uh, information system protection, of supply chain protection, and within supply chain of hardware and software assurance. It's a tall order, it is complicated. The participation of agencies like BSA and expert companies like Sonatype obviously would be helpful. But the theory was that it shouldn't be a government function that's, or a government entity that does the scoring. We thought it would be better to have an independent entity because it would be more likely to have the trust both of those who are in the commercial community as well as the trust of those in government who may rely upon its outcome. And uh, MITRE Corporation continues to look at a number of ways in which such a, a scoring entity might uh, be created. And I've read that uh, from some senior defense officials that there are a number of different initiatives being examined to, uh, to start to uh, assess and, and assign uh, security score to the protections of contractors of their information systems. My only comment would be uh, what constitutes appropriate state of care, right? So I think this group right here might be a group that could actually, uh, on, to my right anyway, that might be able to describe what that would mean, make, make that determination, establish what that is. But I would propose that don't forget that it's a moving bar, and that's the idea of delivering compromises. The bar moves every day because the challenge increases every day and we can't have it stagnant. But in a post-loss review, a group like this would actually make the determination, you know, were they in fact operating at the appropriate state of care? That's, that's my simple answer. Okay, well, um, I don't know if this has been disquieting to you. It's certainly been an eye-opener. Uh, this has been a great panel. Thanks to Director Stevens for setting the stage with his opening remarks. Thanks to Robert for rounding it up. Please join me in thanking this group.